and they take your seats. I want you, even as you're sitting down, think about what you just said. That he is able. And he's able to do exceedingly abundantly above and beyond even you can ask for faith. Who am I to deny what the Lord can do? <laughs> and you can't, cannot even begin to imagine what seeds he's planted in your heart and in your life that in the next weeks and months are going to harvest in a fruitful way, in a, in a bountiful way. Well, I've just been thinking about the fact that, you know, we've been here all day and that you were probably filled up to, to overflowing. Like you ain't got no more room left for nothing that's going to be said at this point. I've asked the Lord to give you enough strength and energy for whatever exclamation point he wants to put on the end of this day. That you won't miss anything. That if he's going to fill it up to overflowing, then we'll have our laps ready for all the overflow to gather up what he's got for us. Amen. Kind of reminds me of growing up in the house I grew up in. My mama would be cooking. She cooked a lot throughout the week, but Sunday afternoon meals were an entirely different situation. Mm -hmm. The Sunday afternoon meal, she would start making it on Saturday night. Some of you may have had a mama like that, where you could feel, you could smell the roast roasting all throughout the night. The yeast rolls were over there rising. She'd have the noodles out and prepared because she was going to make macaroni and cheese the next day. The sweet potatoes would be sitting on the counter because she was going to candy those jokers the next day. And make some candy pans in the kitchen. And we are going to have some sweet tea to go with it. Y'all are getting hungry, aren't you? Yeah. It was a whole Sunday afternoon thing. And then, you know, when you eat a meal like that, not just nitpicking little bits here and there, but when you have a Sunday afternoon meal, you are filled up to overflowing. The only thing you're good for after that is a nap. Yeah, y'all grew up like me. <laughs> Sunday afternoon nap. And sometimes we feel that way, that we're just filled up. We have no more room, no more space. We just need a good nap. But God in his goodness increases our capacity gives us opportunity to receive everything he has. And, and just like my mom, in the days that followed after a Sunday, I remember that any time we would come to her and we say, Mom, I want something to eat, she would never make anything new. She would open up the refrigerator where there were leftovers from Sunday. She would pull out the stuff that we were too full to consume on that day and may have looked like waste to somebody else with a less skilled, masterful eye. But not my mom. She would take out all the leftovers she would dice them, chop them, stir them up, reconfigure them, put them in a casserole dish, pour some, you know, cream of mushroom soup over it, and stir it up, and she'd sprinkle cheese on top, because, you know, the blessing of God is on cheese. <laughs> and then she'd put it in the oven, and after about 20, 25 minutes, she'd pull it out, she'd give it this French-sounding name, and then she'd set it on the table. And we would devour it thinking it was something brand new. But if it wasn't brand new, it was just leftovers Come in on. the hands of a master. Come on. This is what God's going to do. All the things that you feel like you've been too full to be able to fully retain or do business with today, maybe you feel like it's been lost in the shuffle because you're filled up to overflowing. God is such a masterful chef. And in the days that follow, he's going to take all that leftovers. He's going to dice them up, reconfigure them, stir them all together, top them off with, you know, some cream of the Holy Ghost. Oh, <laughs> Sprinkle some grace and mercy on top because grace and mercy makes everything better. <laughs> and then, yes, sometimes he puts us in the fire of trial for just a little while. Mm. But like any good chef, he knows exactly the right moment to prove that. Yeah. Yeah. And then he's going to give you a brand new name mm. and set you down in front of everybody that's in your sphere of influence so that they can taste and see that our God is through. <laughs> so nothing has been wasted today. Everything God has for you, he will make it his business to see to it that you receive. So, Lord Jesus, in these last few minutes that we have, we're already filled up, but, Lord, we're ready for the overflow. So everything you've got for us in these last few moments, we want to receive it in Jesus' name. Everybody agree and say amen? Amen. 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 Jerry and I have been married for about 25 years. It's July. We've raised three sons. I have a 21-year-old, a 19-year-old, and a 15-year-old. And now that they are older and the oldest two are at university, so they don't even live at our house anymore, I find myself reminiscing a bit more often about when they were young, their formative years, and I would spend those, that time with them that you do when they're really little wrestling all their little schedules and all their little needs and desires. And one of the things I would do to fill up the time during the day is that I would take my boys fishing. Now you need to know that during their formative years, we lived in a fairly rural 
central part of the Dallas Fort Worth area. It felt like it was worlds away, but it was really only 20 minutes from downtown if you get there real quick. But once you drove into our little neck of the woods, it really did feel like it was in, a, in an entirely different city. Lazy two-lane road that we lived on. Everybody had a pretty significant plot of land. That's what drew me to this area. But I love the fact that there was trees and, and that there was room for them to run around and there were creeks out there and you know, things boys need in their life like bugs and mud and stuff like that. <laughs> and so I wanted so much to be out there in this particular neighborhood. And so when we finally moved there, I got so excited about the fact that we're gonna be able to have some room to go outside and run around and play. Because I'm the kind of mama that believes in go outside and play. Are there any other parents in the room that still believe in go outside and play? And let me tell you something, anytime those jokers had the nerve to come to me and say that they were bored, I would say, no, you're not. You see that tree right there? Go play with it. <laughs> you can eat it, you can play tag with the tree, I don't care what you do. Like, you're not going to be bored out here in the country. So we felt the time being outdoors. Our neighbor across the street, that my son still call Aunt Rachel to this day, she has a huge pond at the front of her property. It's like two acres of just a pond. So we would walk across the street. We would grab the, the two fishing poles that I bought on sale at the local, local super Walmart around the corner. And then I also got this tackle box that was on sale. I put some, you know, bobbers in it, those ex, those bobby things that you need. And I also put some extra hooks in case we needed it. Had some scissors in there too, in case we needed to cut the line. And I had gloves. Because I don't know if y'all can tell by looking at me or not, but I don't mind going fishing, but I ain't been actually touching no fish. <laughs> So we gathered up whatever hot dog meat was left from the week, because that was our base, and you know, we were professionals. And we'd walk across the street to this little mm. cove that was at the edge of the pond. We'd stand there right underneath the shade of the trees, because the, sh the shade made it so that the fish would gather right there in this little pocket. And we'd put the line in the water. And y'all, within the first 15, 20 seconds of the line being in the water, we would automatically see tugs on that line, pretty severe tugs, and then within a minute or two, we'd pull up a fish. And then we'd celebrate that little sun perch, something really small. We would get it unhooked, and then we would throw it back in, put the lines back in the water, and catch another fish. Within an hour, we could catch 15 or 20 fish, one after the other. And we did it all the time. The boys loved it because this is the kind of fishing a five-year-old needs in his life, right? Instant gratification. <laughs> so I thought because we did it so much at home that the boys must just like fishing in general. And one summer we were at a camp that's about an hour and a half away from our house. We brought the fishing poles with us. So early one morning I said, boys, let's get up before the dining hall opens. Let's go to the lake that is here and let's fish. So we went down at 7 a.m. early in the morning so we could keep out of the hottest part of that Texas day. We put the lines in the water and we fished. And fished. <laughs> and Lord have mercy. <laughs> 45 minutes went by, an hour went by. And not only did we not catch anything, there wasn't even a tug on the line. I mean, it just seemed completely lifeless underneath the surface of the water. And then I got intent and a little bit of deliberate about making sure we could figure out a different way to put the bait. Maybe we weren't throwing it in in the right place. We needed to figure this out. And at one point I looked up and realized that my sons weren't even there with me anymore. And that what happened to me. You look up and kids are So I'm looking around and I realized they have run over into a nearby field. They're throwing a football with each other. So I'm all by myself fishing early in the morning. The boys aren't there. I yell over to them, boys, get back over here and fish with me. I didn't come out here this early for my health this morning. I came to spend time with you. Get back over here and let's fish. My oldest one yelled back at me and said, well, mom, we don't really like fishing like that. <laughs> my second son said, yeah, mom, fishing's not supposed to be that hard. <laughs> So I sat there for a little while longer with my line in the water, and I was chuckling a little bit about what my boys had said. But that second statement is the one that stuck with me. Fishing is not supposed to be that hard. It occurs to me that in a group this size, there are some of you that this day has met you and intersected with your life at a time where you feel exactly like my boy. 
Hmm. Because you've been at this for a while. Hmm. Whatever fishing trip, whatever assignment, whatever endeavor, whatever industry, whatever entrepreneurial investment that you've been making, whatever you've been trying to build or cultivate, you've invested your time, your money, your talent, your ideas, your skill. You've had your line in the water for a while, but on this Saturday you feel a little bit discouraged because Friday. you don't feel like the harvest, the benefits that you're receiving Friday. are worth the investment Friday. that you've been Friday. making. <laughs> You feel like my boy, that I, I knew fishing was going to be so hard, but I did not know that this assignment was going to be this hard. And so on a day like today, where you have gotten strategy, you have gotten insight, you have gotten biblical principles, I just felt like of all the things you've received at the end of this day, that some of you could use some plain old flat out encouragement. Amen. Because it's been hard on this journey. And you've been given it everything you've got, and you just need a little holy and divine sacred momentum so that you can keep going and keep showing up for the assignment that God has entrusted to you and the ones he's entrusted to me. So for anybody in the room, and you know what it feels like to have a fishing trip gone bad. There is a fisherman in scripture who knows exactly how that feels. His story is found in Luke's gospel, the fifth chapter. I'll just read it to you so you'll see and hear and understand exactly what happened. I think there are some encouragement in this text for you and for me today. Luke chapter 5, beginning at the very first verse, it says, Now it came about that while the multitude were pressing in on him, that's Jesus, and listening to the word of God, he was standing by the Sea of Galilee, and verse 2 says, And he saw, somebody said he saw. He saw. He saw two boats that were lying at the edge of the lake, but the fishermen had already gotten out of them, and they were washing their nets. Let's just start right here with these two familiar verses. Many of you have probably heard this particular story before from Luke's Gospel. When Jesus shows up on this morning, the author writes that he already sees Simon Peter. He's gotten out of his boat and he's already washing his net. Simon Peter had not just been fishing for 45 minutes like me and my boys or for an hour or even two or three. This brother had been fishing all night long. And he didn't have one fish to show for his effort. Some of you know exactly how that feels. If you haven't been at this for a day. You didn't just start last week. You've been at this for several months and have turned into several years. The idea that you've been trying to implement and put feet on, that you've been praying and asking the Lord for divine connections, divine revelation, insight, so that you can put some feet to the dreams that the Lord has entrusted in you for your business or your ministry or for your family. Simon knows how it feels to fish all night long, give it everything you've got, and still come up empty him. And the author says that when Jesus approaches that morning, the edge of the Sea of Galilee, he says that there's a multitude pressing in on Jesus. I love authors like this who give us a whole lot of meat to put on the bones of the story. He wants you to know what the crowd was like. That it was a multitude. Scholars believe it wasn't just a couple dozen people or even a couple hundred. There were probably several thousand that were gathered on this particular day. And the author says they were pressing on Jesus. In other words, they were the opposite of what you and I have been today. Calmly, casually, sitting, sedately, listening to what is being shared with you. That wasn't this crowd. This crowd was pressing in on Jesus. They were trying to get as close as they possibly could. This was a clamoring, chaotic, confusing whirlwind of noise and people trying to elbow their way past one another so that they could get as close as they possibly could to this Jesus because he was the one they remembered where that one woman with the issue of blood had forced her way through the crowd and when she touched Jesus, her whole life had been changed. So they wanted to get as close as they possibly could to Jesus because y'all, even if they didn't believe, even if they weren't quite sure about this whole Messiah business, they didn't know if the kingdom of God was at hand. They didn't know if this was the Redeemer that the prophets had spoken about from the Old Testament. They didn't know about all that. But what they did know was that when this guy showed up, blind people could see. What they knew was that when Jesus showed up, the lame could walk and the dead were raised. And every time Jesus opened up his mouth and they heard Jesus teach, they had heard teaching and preaching before from the religious leaders of the day, but they had never heard anything like this. And 
so when Jesus showed up, y'all, a crowd came and they weren't okay with just being in the back of the crowd somewhere in listening distance. No, they wanted to get as close as they possibly could to Jesus, so much so that they had backed him up against the shoreline of the Sea of Galilee. Think about how you and I would feel if Jesus were our Bible study teacher. Mm. There wouldn't be anything casual about that meeting. And there Jesus is in the midst of a world and thousands of people trying to get his attention, trying to get close to him. And in the midst of all of that confusion, verse 2 says, he saw one man who had a bad night vision. Here's my first bit of encouragement for you today, brothers and sisters. That you need to know that no matter how big the crowd gets, no matter how many other needs he also has to tend to, no matter how many other issues are concerning others and thus concerning him, no matter how many other prayer requests he is also having to deal with, you need to know that even with a multitude swirling around Jesus, we serve a God who sees you. And if we're not careful, we can race past it real quickly on to more important things. But I don't want you or me to ever hear something casual and small like this and act like it's no big deal. That the God of the universe sees you. I mean, just let it sit on you for just a minute because this is God we're talking about. Y'all know he don't need us, right? Right. <laughs> you know, he doesn't have to have a relationship with us. He doesn't have to be this invested. He could just sit in the heavens and just rule from on high. But no, he's not happy just being separate from us. He wants to be intimately engaged in the details of our life. He cares and concerns himself with us. And this is God that we're talking about, the one who controls the thrones of the galaxies, the ones who's making sure that neighborhoods in the galaxy that scientists do not even know exist, he's making sure that they're calibrated today while we're sitting here in this room. This is the God of the universe that made sure the sun got to its appointed post this morning. He's the one that will hold it in space all day long until basically it swaps places with the moon later on tonight. He's the one that will hang every single star in the sky. He knows all of them by name. He knows all of them by number. He's the one that while we're sitting in this room on occasion today, he's making sure that the earth spins on its axis at just the right speed to make sure that we can sustain life there. Yeah. And a God that great and My that mighty and that, that powerful and that all-knowing, that girl. great God cares My about girl. you. He knows what happened in your past. He knows who wronged you. He knows who you wronged. 
He knows the things that are our weaknesses. He knows your strengths. He knows what your mama and them did. He knows what your cousin and them did. He knows how your business partner did you wrong, which landed you back up at square one. He's fully aware of everything that's gone. He sees you and he's got you. Thank you, Jesus. Okay? So he sees Simon Peter. Simon Peter's already discouraged. Remember, he's already fished all night long at this point. He's gotten out of the boat. He's washing his neck, and Jesus sees him. And then verse 3 says, He got into the boat, which was Simon's. Verse 3, Jesus gets into the boat. I'm going to tell you that when I'm reading a portion of Scripture, if something is repeated in a short space of time, I know that it's not repeated because God likes to hear himself talk. I know if it's repeated, that probably means we're supposed to lean in and pay attention. The same thing is true if something seems to be opposite in a very short space of time. The Bible is inerrant and unchanging. So if something seems to be contrasting, that means lean in, pay attention. What endears me and rivets me about verse 3, Jesus getting into the boat, is that it was just one verse earlier, verse 2, that Simon got out of the boat. Verse 2, Simon's out. Verse 3, Jesus is in. <laughs> the very thing that was so frustrating, so discouraging, so aggravating to Simon that all he wanted to do was get out of it in verse 2 was the very thing that when Jesus showed up in verse 3 trying to figure out the best place for him to stand, he chose the abandoned boat circumstance of Simon's experience and turned that empty platform into a pulpit. Not only does Jesus see you, he wants to get into the very things that have made you want to get out. The places in your life and mine that we most want to abandon, we most want to quit, we most want to jump ship, that they represent for us frustration and irritation and things that have exacerbated us and exhausted us. We want to abandon the marriage. We want to abandon the commitment. We want to abandon the kids. We want to abandon the job. We want to abandon the assignment. We want to abandon the, the ministry. We want to abandon the business. The thing you most want to get out of is the thing he wants to get into. Yes. Can I tell you that if you're at verse 2 today, if this Friday has met you at verse 2 where all you want to do is get out, all you want to do is hang your head down in discouragement, I say to you, verse 3 is on the way. So lift up your eyes to the hills and the sea. That empty place in your life, that empty platform that's not filled with the fish you thought you had by now, that empty platform, he's going to turn into a pulpit. He's going to stand in that post in your life and be able to declare to everybody in your sphere of influence, I am who I say I am. And I can still do everything that I say that I can do. So when Jesus showed up on that morning, y'all, with thousands of people needing to hear the words that were going to come out of his mouth, and when Jesus was looking for the best place for him to stand as he's being backed up against the shoreline, of the Sea of Galilee. He's trying to figure out how to make sure he can naturally amplify his voice because there's no microphones, there are no speakers. He's got to turn this natural geographical area into an amphitheater because he wants to make sure the people on the front row don't miss what he's going to say and the people in the furthest reaches of this group don't miss what he's going to say. So when he looked around to find the best place to stand, he chose the emptiness of someone's life. Listen to me. The place in my life and in yours where we feel like we keep coming up empty handed, that's the place where we ought not be discouraged. We ought to grow in holy expectation and anticipation that if God left this margin in my life, that must mean he's leaving room for himself. I'll put it this way. My weakness is, has become something I brag about, actually. Mm -hmm. Because in my weakness, I've learned his strength is perfect. Woo. So, God is sovereign. Okay? 
He has many attributes, omnipresent, omniscient, holy, mighty, we could go on and on. My favorite of all the attributes of God is his sovereignty. Somebody say sovereignty. Sovereignty. Let me tell you about sovereignty. Mm -hmm. Sovereignty means that our God existed before time began. That is pre-Genesis 1-1. Mm -hmm. In fact, the only reason why there was a Genesis 1-1 is because he was already there to say, let there be, and there was. Yeah. Sovereignty means that he was in eternity past. He has seen the entire spectrum of time, Genesis 1-1, all the way to the end of the spectrum, which is Revelation, which we have not yet seen. And he has already been in eternity future. Mm -hmm. But sovereignty does not just mean that he's seen the entire spectrum of time and, et and eternity. Sovereignty means he's got the whole thing in the palm of his hands. Amen. And if your life and mine is just a blip on the radar screen of that entire spectrum, and he's got all of that in the palm of his hands, it means he's got your life in the palm of his hands too. Amen. Sovereignty, if we believe it, is what will allow us to do what Psalm 4610 says. Cease striving. Chill out. Be still. And know that I am God. So we're going to take God's sovereignty and apply it to this passage right here in Luke chapter 5. In Luke chapter 5, if Jesus, the one true and living God, is sovereign, that means he knew before Simon ever left to go fishing in the first place that Simon was going to fish and catch nothing. Jesus in his sovereignty already knew that when Simon started out the night before, that he was going to throw his line in at 7 p.m. and then at 9 p.m. his nets were going to go in at midnight and then 1 a.m. and there would be a discouraging 2 a.m. and a disbelief at 3 a.m. and an aggravation setting in at 4 a.m. that the wee hours of the morning were going to leave Simon with emptiness. Jesus in his sovereignty knew that and he still let Simon go fishing. Listen to me, the Lord in his sovereignty will often let us go on fishing trips that he knows up front you ain't going to catch no fish. <laughs> he knows that your experience is not going to be enough. Your skill, your connections, your degrees, your talent, your ideas, none of it is going to be enough. He oftentimes will call us to accomplish things that he knows the best talent and skill we have to offer is not going to be able to stretch all the way to his supernatural plan for our life. And the reason why he will call us to do things that we cannot do in our own strength and power is because in every single one of the lives of his sons and daughters, he wants us to always have in our life what I like to call God margin. God margin is the empty space that exists between what you can do in your own strength and what God can do in his spirit. <laughs> he leaves God margin, empty margin in our life that no matter what we do, no matter what solutions we bring, no matter what strategies we apply and implement, he knows that there are margins in our life that unless he does it, it will not be accomplished. Yeah. And the reason why is, because if he would have allowed Simon to fill up the platform of his boat with a bunch of flipping, flopping fish, there would have been no room for Jesus' feet. And Jesus is trying to leave room for his feet in your life and in mine. He's trying to leave room for himself. Because Jesus now stands on the emptiness of Simon's experience and he ministers to thousands of people that are gathered in Peter's sphere of influence. Do you know that there are people in your sphere of influence? They're right there following you on your social media page. They're right there in the PTA that your children are involved in. They're right there in the organization that you're involved in in your neighborhood. They're right there in your sphere of influence. And the greatest message they will ever hear from you or from me about how great our God is will not come from the words that we say. They'll come from the testimony we have of the empty places in our life that Jesus filled up with himself and took nothing and made it safe. And can I tell you, our God is good at taking nothing and making something. Okay. In fact, impossible is where he starts. That's the beginning point for our God. So if you feel like all you've got is emptiness to work with, emptiness is all you need. Because he's left room for himself. And once Jesus shows up into the equation, y'all, everything changes. Amen. 
So he speaks to thousands of people from Simon's emptiness. Simon is the one with the front row seat. Everybody else is a little, a few yards away. They're standing on the shore. They're listening and observing what it is that is happening. But Simon is the disciple with the front row seat to every single thing that Jesus is saying. And then Jesus stops talking to all the multitude and he looks down at the one who has had a front row seat in verse 4. And he says, now Simon, let's go deep sea fishing. The shallow stuff was for everybody else. Hmm. The deep stuff is for the one who has had the front row seat. The deep stuff is for the one who's been pulled close all day long, that the Lord has fed you from his hand, principles from the scriptures that he's wanted to make sure we go home and implement in our lives that transforms our very existence and the existence of the people in our sphere of influence. I know that this is a big crowd today, y'all, but there are eight plus billion people that are on the planet. And of all those billions of people, he chose us to have a front row seat all day long. I don't want you to think that it is by chance that you happen to be in this room. Even if the person that you're sitting next to drug you here, kicking and screaming, you still don't even know how you got here. We thought you were going to just hang out for a day and see movies or something. Here you've been sitting all day long, and you're still a little bit unclear about how it happened. You need to know that even if you're surprised that you're in this room, Jeremiah 1.5 says that before the foundation of the world, he knew that this would be on the calendar of your life. And the only reason why he would give you and me a front row seat all day long like this to what he says in his word about intermixing the marketplace and ministry, the only way, reason he'd give us this front row seat is if in the next days and weeks and months that are about to follow, he's getting ready to look to all of the disciples who's had a front row seat and say, now let's go do some fishing. Wow. Let's see if everything you listen to, you're going to incorporate into your actual life. Mm -hmm. Let's see if you're just going to be a hearer or if you're going to be a doer. Okay. But at some point, in fact, I need y'all to know this, I'm sorry to tell you, but you have been set up all day long. You've been just set up. <laughs> because the only reason the Lord allows us to be filled up to overflowing is because he's preparing us in advance for the steps of faith he's about to ask us to take. own two feet. Like your skill is enough in shallow water. Your talent is enough in shallow water. The degrees you have are enough in shallow water. The knowledge that you've already gathered, the experience that you've already had, we can take care of ourselves in shallow water. The question is, what do we do when God calls us to deep water? To the place of faith where we are in over our heads. Where we don't know what to do anymore about this marital issue, about raising these teenagers, about investing in this industry, about being able to start this ministry and bring it to some sort of life and fruitfulness. We are all tapped out of ideas. Jesus says, you're ready. Let's go deep. And most of the time, when Jesus says, let's go deep, if you're anything like me, you say what Simon Peter said. Jesus, come on, you know we've already been fishing all night long, right? <laughs> Jesus, you have no idea what it is that you're talking about. Jesus, how about you stick to preaching and I'll take care of the fishing. You take care of the sacred stuff and leave me here with the secular stuff. You pour them on Sundays, Jesus. I'll take care of Monday through Saturday. But not for the kingdom builder. Not for the disciple. Not for the ones of us who have decided that for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Amen. Not for those of us who decided that every facet, every aspect of our life, every bit of industry or ministry, that there is no separation between the two. There is no secular and sacred for the kingdom-minded disciple. Everything is sacred. Everything belongs to him. Everything is for his glory. So if you're a doctor, you're a doctor for the glory of God. If you're an entrepreneur, you're an entrepreneur for the glory of God. If you're a lawyer, then the Bar Association is getting ready to see what God looks like when God tries the case. If you're an actor, or a producer, or a director, everything you do in the artistic realm is for the glory of God. That you are excellent at your skill, you are excellent at your craft, so that anybody in your industry, if they tried to deny you, they couldn't because you're too good at your job. Amen. But when they ask you where 
I can get that from you, Sam, it is because I serve the one who makes it And everything I have came and everything I have will return to So Simon said, it doesn't make sense, but at your bidding, I'll go anyway. They pushed out into deep water, and Jesus said, Simon, throw out your net for a catch. Jesus did not say, fish, get in the boat. Because, come on, y'all, this is Jesus we're talking about. Y'all know he could have just said, fish, get in the boat. And fish would have just started jumping in the boat from everywhere. This is the one who told the winds and the waves, peace, be still. He was the commander of creation. He could have done that, but he didn't. He said, no, Peter, you throw out your net. So I have a miracle for you. But if you refuse to cooperate and put in the sweat equity I'm asking of you, you will never get what I have in store for you. 